Tepu, welcome to Kemetic Legacy Today, your weekly journal of ancient African, ancient Kemetic history and spirituality. My name is Jabari Osaze, also known as Henro Jeronima Maat Aten Ra. And my name is Anika Daniels Osaze, also known as Unfurka Maat. Today we're going to deal with, I think, a very important topic, a, a topic that is probably of interest of, to anyone who is trying to live in the Kemetic lifestyle, uh, and, or who just simply want to understand that there is actually a description of how to live a more divine life. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, we're going to begin today an ongoing series on what is generally called Kemetic Sebayit literature. And so some of you are probably wondering, what does Sebayit mean? Sebayit is generally translated as teachings or wisdom. And so essentially what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about this large, comprehensive body of work from ancient Kemet that tell us exactly how we should live a divine life. Yes, you've heard it. Some of you might think that the beginning of, that, of, of this body of work starts in, in Greece, but clearly it starts thousands of years earlier in Kemet. So we're going to begin with Sebayit literature today. Okay. So part of that will be surrounding the maxims of Patahotep, which uh, is understood as being one of the first books ever written. At a full, complete book ever written in ancient Kemet. And many of the maxims that Patahotep has given are based on the concept of ma'at, which represents truth, order, balance, law, harmony, reciprocity. And in order to live a divine life, you have to live within constant balance, which is ma'at. If you do not live within that balance, then you are following into the steps of isfet, which is considered to be roughly translated as mischief or evil. So in order to make sure that you never fall into that trap, you have to look, in, look towards ma'at. Now, we could talk about ma'at for many, many hours. Uh, our center is named after ma'at, the Center for Restoration of Ma'at. In my own name, in Furkan Ma'at, I use that. And we will have a future episode where we focus just on ma'at and the understanding. But just briefly, Ma'at is a force that wasn't created, wasn't born. You won't find a creation story anywhere of Ma'at. Ma'at just is. Ma'at has always existed and always been present. And without Ma'at, you couldn't differentiate anything within that Na'um. So Ma'at is that defining order that tells you how the world is supposed to be. And Patahotep, knowing that, decided that he would find 37 maxims to explain how you can live your entire life in that perfect harmony. And these are maxims that you can actually use today, something that's over 4,400 years old. That's right. And as we talk about Ma'at, um, Anika has really well described the importance of Ma'at. We always revel at the fact that in one of the most widely noted creation stories from ancient Kemet, the great divine force, Ptah, comes out of the divine mother, the Noun. Mm -hmm. Anika mentioned the Noun. This is the, the great primordial waters. And as he comes out of the Noun, he talks about how he creates all the other divine forces. He creates uh, Ast, who we've talked about very recently. Mm -hmm. He creates Asar. He creates all of these divine forces. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't create Ma'at. It is just said that Ma'at is with him. And so, as Anika has described it aptly, Ma'at is the order of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so we will definitely 
uh, be talking a lot about Ma'at today, but we'll really do another show to, to cover it in depth as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of other individuals that we'd also like to interview to talk about Ma'at, and, and hopefully we'll be able to have them on the show as well. Exactly. And so Aniko also mentioned that the, the Maxims of Patahotep were one of the world's first books. There are older books. Mm -hmm. They come from Kemet as well, but we haven't been able to find complete versions of those books. Mm -hmm. The only complete book that we have found that dates as early as this is the Maxima Patahotep. And so it's critically important for us to also realize sort of the irony in this, that um, one of the first books ever to be, cre to be created comes out of Africa, yet the ancestors of Africans in many parts of the world have had the challenges to where, in some instances, it was illegal for them to learn to read and write. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that there's a great degree of painful irony in that, that um, Africans give literature, give reading, give literacy to the entire world, mm -hmm. but at some point in history uh, are prevented from being able to do so. And so I, I think that that's quite interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And um, as we talk about the Maxims of Patahotep, we should also note that um, these Maxims were in use for a very long period of time. As Anika has mentioned, it they were written some nearly 4,400 years ago um, by this man named Patahotep, who we'll talk about more in a few moments. Mm -hmm. But they continue to be used all the way up until probably the Arab invasion of Kemet, which is in the seventh century AD. Mm -hmm. The seventh century, as some people would say, um, in the common era. Mm -hmm. And so we are talking about a very long period of time, thousands of years, that these writings were, were known and were, were looked at as, as sources of divine wisdom. Mm -hmm. And we should also note that it also came into um, what is generally called hermetic literature, where um, some of the teachings of Kemet filtered their way into the great teachings of Western literature. Um, and individuals consider them to be sort of secret books on the order of the universe. And so Patahotep also found its way into those books as well. We particularly thought it was important to do this lecture. I know I've been talking to Jabari about some of my pet peeves just of what I've seen in society. A few things such as just not knowing how to speak to each other. You know, you, you see people having arguments on the street and um, men disrespecting women, women disrespecting men, genders disrespecting each other. Uh, you know, young men, older men, pick up your pants. <laughs> you know, I know that might seem a little off topic, but a lot of the, uh, as early as 4,400, uh, or as old as 4,400 years, you know, they had a go. A go. They right. talked about how to dress. They talked about how to respect yourself. They talked about just how to present yourself. There's a whole section on etiquette. Mm -hmm you know, that we can use today. And, you know, we love you young brothers and, you know, older brothers who are still doing this, but you really need to learn how to respect yourself and respect others and think highly of yourself. You're all kings. And, you know, I'm starting to see some of the young ladies do it as well. You're queens and you need to act as such. And that's why this episode is particularly important to us because we just want to talk about some of the things that you can uh, use in practical mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. a practical uh, basis. That's right. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that we're not just speaking to those in the African and African American communities. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about talking to those who are, if you're human, these maxims are important <laughs> to you. If you walk on two feet, you want to know about what Brother Patahotep told us and, and how he described how to live a divine life. Because I, I truly believe that virtually anyone, wherever they are on this planet, mm -hmm. can learn a lot from these incredible maxims. Mm -hmm. Now, we mentioned that there were other incredible works. Um, some of the other books that um, are, or portions of books in most instances, that are part of this great Sebaid uh, body of literature, literature are the instructions of Kagenni, um, the maxims of Patahotep are, of course, the ones we're going to talk about today, and also the maxims of Kensu Hotep. Now, you may note that we often say a prayer on this show. Mm -hmm. We generally call it the Amasu. It's a, it's a shortened way that we usually refer to it. And the Amasu comes from that book called the Maxims of Kensu Hetep. Mm -hmm. And so generally speaking, we're going to begin to look at all of these divine books in a way that hopefully will be um, very, very uh, practical to you. Because we are very, very clear that at the Center for the Restoration of Ma'at, we are about understanding history, 
but we're also about living mm -hmm. that which our ancestors found to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not just about uh, the, the intellectual pursuit of knowledge, it's also about figuring out what we're supposed to be doing here based on what we've done in the past as well. And this was carved in stone. Our ancestors knew that one day we would forget all of this, and they found the most permanent way to make sure that this message would still get across to us. And so let's begin by talking a little, about, a bit, little bit about who this, this um, great Patahotep is. Uh, we should note that it, the Maxims of Patahotep were probably written somewhere between 2412 and 2375 BCE, before the Common Era. Mm -hmm. And so like we said, they're virtually 4,400 years old. And so why should you listen to this man? <laughs> Patahotep was a noble during the Fifth Dynasty under the, kin, the king uh, Jed Kare, and, and Jed Kara um, Isesi actually was one of the kings that did some very interesting things. There, there's, there are things that we don't know about his, his rulership, but of the things that we know about his rulership, we know that he sent expeditions to Sinai, we know that he sent expeditions to Nubia, mm -hmm. and in fact, interestingly, he also sent an expedition to um, this land that we call Punt. Mm -hmm. We talked about Punt when we um, discussed Pepe II, mm -hmm. and also when we talked about Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut. Mm -hmm. two individuals that we may also do uh, additional focus, have additional focus on later on. But keep in mind that these ancient Kemetic people always had this connection to this land named Punt because they believed that this was the land where their ancestors came from. And for those of you who have not watched this show, where did they say this area was? Mm -hmm. there been a, there's been a lot of analysis, a lot of study on exactly where the land of Punt has been, is, and most people believe that it's probably in the area around Somalia, Eritrea, or possibly Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about areas that are further into the, the, re, the interior of Africa. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why these great rulers would send um, expeditions there is because they believe that these individuals some of the diminutive Africans, people that we generally call dwarfs today, um, I don't particularly like that term, mm -hmm. short people, they believe that those people were able to do the dance of the ants of the, of the inter, the dance of the divine. And so we have to keep in mind that all of this also ties back to our history in the interior of Africa as well. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that Patahotep might have actually been chosen to be king. But instead of becoming king, he actually becomes the vizier. Now, we talked about the, the role of the vizier during our lecture on Imhotep. And I really hope that some of you at home are, are having an opportunity to watch the show online. Because mm -hmm. if you miss something, you're able to go back and, and um, catch up. And, and really what we're doing is we're not, while each of these episodes stands on their own, we're also trying to create a body of work that will help you to live a divine life. So certainly, as we talk about certain things, you should be able to go back to certain episodes and, and look at um, how they work in further detail. But to say a quick deal about what the vizier is, the vizier is similar to a prime minister. That is that this vizier had much of, of the responsibility of the insubid, of the pharaoh, and found a way to work towards the good of the kingdom mm -hmm. in probably most, some of the most important ways. I know that during the time of, um, of Imhotep, it said that the, um, the vizier was the person that was in charge of all the things that the heavens and the earth could bring, all the things that the river Hapi can bring. And, and I think that's just a beautiful way of saying that they were essentially responsible for all of the affairs of the state. Mm -hmm. And so the vizier is a critically important role. And this man, Patahotep, played that role in a very important period of time. We're talking about the Old Kingdom, folks. We're talking about the oldest period of Kemetic history. Critical, critically, critically important to the development of the rest of Kemet and to the rest of human civilization as well. But he was also probably seen as one of the first philosophers where That's many right. of the Greeks may have gotten their information from, mm -hmm. or at least started the understanding of philosophy and how it can be used in the moral understanding of life. Now keep in mind that that is actually a controversial topic these days. Mm -hmm. There have been several African-centered scholars who have made this argument, and I'll tell you very bluntly, folks, they have really caught a lot of flack for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of flack for saying that philosophy comes from Africa. Mm -hmm. But I find it very interesting that several European authors have made this argument before the African authors. Mm -hmm. 
And so one of them was Isaac Meyer, mm -hmm. who writes in a very important book on, on ancient Kemet and, the, on, and Patahotep. Mm -hmm. um, and so as they begin to describe the importance of Kemet to all of philosophy, keep in mind that this is a continual point throughout history. People continue to, to reference the fact that great teachings come from this land. In addition to that, we should also note that we would not actually have an entire copy of this work were it not for, um, I'll call him a French Egyptophile. He was someone who loved everything um, from Kemet. Um, his name is Priest de Avens. Mm -hmm. Priest de Avens. He began um, to search for papyri on ancient Kemet, and he purchases a copy of uh, the Maxims of Ptahotep and the last two pages of the Maxims of Kadgemi, which are probably older, coming from the, the fourth dynasty. He purchases a copy in 1843 and returns it to France, and that's exactly where the, the whole copy sits today. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the National Library of, of France currently. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the importance of this man, Patahotep, we should recognize that he is buried in an area that is generally called Saqqara today, or Saqqara today. Mm -hmm. Luckily, Anika and I have an opportunity to visit his tomb every year. And we go there with a large group of students, a large group of adults, and we have the opportunity to talk about the importance of literacy and the importance of living a divine life in the tomb of the man that wrote this wonderful book. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful tomb. It, it's, um, beautifully carved, beautifully painted. There are wonderful images of Patahotep there. Um, it's generally in the form that we call mastaba, by the way. And for those of you who are familiar with this um, description, I'm still looking for the comedic term for mastaba. Generally speaking, mastaba is an Arabic word that means bench. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they began to be called mastabas is because of the shape of the tomb. It looked like a rectangular tomb that um, tapered in at the top. And so when you would look at it, it looked like what the Arabic people thought looked like a bench mm -hmm. that perhaps the gods would sit on is mm -hmm. what they would say. Mm -hmm. And so as we go in, we are able to commune with one of our most divine ancestors. And so with that, I think we should just get into our description of these 37 maxims. Clearly, folks, you know that our show is an hour-long show. There's no way we're going to get through all 37. And there are even those who have taken, I should say, the, the beginning and the ending and added other maxims based on the, the wisdom that this man was giving. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that at this point he's saying that he's over 110 years old. Mm -hmm. Very, very old. Now, is this a symbolic description? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But he says that he's at the point where his hearing is failing, he has difficulty walking, he has difficulty breathing. It's very, very difficult to be an old man, but he's writing these great maxims for his spiritual son mm -hmm. because he believes that this young man will do well to understand exactly how to live a divine life and how, how also to succeed. For those of you who are in um, the business world and, and you're thinking about how, what you should do to get ahead, these maxims are right up your alley as well. He yeah. talks about some things that will truly assist you with getting ahead in business as well. Mm -hmm. And so with that, let's get on to it. Okay. So maxim number one, on humility and the quest for the perfect world, for perfect word, excuse me. Don't be conceited about your own knowledge. Take advice from the ignorant as well as from the wise since there is no single person who embodies perfection, nor any craftsman who has reached the limits of excellence. The perfect word is as rare as an emerald, yet it has been found among maidservants working at the millstone. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. It is one of my favorite um, maxims for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. First off, let's talk about the fact that he is talking about l being sure that you're not arrogant being sure that you now have your, your, um, your degrees and all of a sudden you think you know everything and that you can't listen to people who don't have degrees as well, that you've achieved in your life and now you're too, um, too knowledgeable to speak to the little people. Mm -hmm. And he's actually saying with all the things that you can achieve, keep in mind that some of the greatest wisdom is found amongst women who are toiling and doing the most difficult work the women at the, the millstone. Mm -hmm. These are women who are grinding bread. Keep in mind that um, in ancient Kemet, you didn't get bread at the, at the corner store. 
someone had to make it for you, as, as today, but someone had to work very, very hard grinding the grains on a stone. It was, it was backbreaking work. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, he believes that the women that are doing this menial labor are some of the most wise people in the world. Mm -hmm. This is not just a description of how to keep yourself grounded, but also a description about the importance of women mm -hmm. 4,400 years ago. And so I think that it's beautiful in that sense as well. You know, for me, it's even important just because I work at an academic institution, and I'm surrounded by everyone who has their degrees, anything from an MD to an MBA to a JD. And these are people who felt like they've arrived. But I find that the more important and the more interesting conversations have come from people who are working security, people who are working in housekeeping, people who are working in food service, because they're living real lives. Mm -hmm. They have a lot to contribute. They have a lot to say. And people don't take the time to listen. Mm -hmm. And they know so much, and they've shared so much, and don't need the degrees to be able to be wise. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to put your pride aside, put your ego aside, and put your titles aside and realize that we're all humans first, we're all people first, and we all bring some kind of knowledge to the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, ready for number two? Let's get to number two. <laughs> On the art of debate with someone who thinks himself superior. In debate with, a, with an opponent who is both sure of himself and seems more skillful than you, keep your head down and don't overreact. Don't challenge him. You wouldn't succeed in matching his argument. But wait till he puts his own case badly, then destroy him utterly by refusing to oppose him. He will be shown up as an ignoramus, and your clear thinking will win the day over his wordiness. Wow. So just wow. being verbose isn't enough, huh? <laughs> if, th is, if this is not a great lesson in learning how to get, a, a, a get ahead in business, in learning how to deal with people on the street, mm -hmm. it is just amazing. Mm -hmm. He's talking about people who think they know everything. And I'm sure that all of you, <laughs> particularly in the world we live in today, I think it's interesting that one of the Greek philosophers, I believe Plato said, that writing was one of the worst things ever created. <laughs> And you might think, how could a philosopher say that writing is one of the worst things ever created? And I believe he said that it was the worst thing ever created because now ignorant people could seem like they know a whole lot. <laughs> and so wisdom is about learning and doing. It's not just about reading stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there are tons of people with all the things you can read. I know that when I watch television these days, I watch it in front of a computer often. And if there's something I don't know, I immediately look it up on, online. And so you can get the sense with all of the information that we have at our hands today that we are wiser than we've ever been. Yet our world is at a place where, um, and I don't want to make things sound too catastrophic, but just look at what we're doing to our environment. Look at what, today certainly I know most people are, are aware of it based on this um, horrific oil spill that's mm -hmm. taking place. Most people are aware of the fact that we are truly destroying our environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but think about what we're doing to our environment. Think about the fact that the divorces are probably at an all-time high. Think about the fact that we have children who are, are so drugged that they have difficulty getting through life. <laughs> Something is wrong. Something is wrong. And so having all this information does not mean that we know all that we need to know. Mm -hmm. And that we're able to apply things in a way that is, uh, that is divinely wise as well. And so this particular uh, maxim deals with how to deal with people who think they know everything. He doesn't say, prove to them that you know more. He doesn't say, speak loudly because people who speak loud are usually considered um, intelligent. intelligent. He doesn't say, learn all the big words that you can because if you know a lot of big words, people will think that you're intelligent. He instead says, let these braggadocious people speak loudly and then as soon as they show that they're ignorant because they're speaking over much, then you can simply say that because they're speaking over much, you're not going to engage in a discussion. You're not going to go back and forth with someone who is so arrogant that they're not truly engendering dialogue. And so I think that that's very wise. Again, the best idea to show wisdom 
for many cases is to just sit and listen. Mm -hmm. You know, t most of the times the quiet person is the one who tends to be the wisest because they sit back, they internalize the information, they meditate on the information before they choose to speak. And then when they finally do have something to say, you realize that it's something so profound only because they took the time to think before speaking. That's right, that's right. It's critically important in using our words carefully rather than just using them as many as we've learned and as fast as we can. It's so much more important to actually think about what to say and to make sure that our words count. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's very powerful as well. Now he says much more about how to discuss um, things with people who uh, come at you in, in different ways as well. Mm -hmm. And so what do we hear about, um, what, what does he address in maxim number three? By the way, we should say that we're reading this particular translation. Um, it's actually called The Wisdom of Patahotep, and it's from an author named Kristen Jacques. And I think that his translation is, is pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen some that, are, that don't have the this, this sort of um, depth in their description, and his is, is, is very good as well. We'll probably, now I know that this is something that folks who have visited our website know, we have been working on a book on the Maxims of Patahotep, and we're still in the conception phase, so we're, we, we are still, um, it's, been, it's gonna be some time until we're able to um, bring it forth. But we plan to do a whole series on the Maxims of Patahotep, and we're going to target them particularly to different groups of people, to students, to people in the business world, mm -hmm. to married couples. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we'll also be able to add, just as Ch Kristen Jacques has, we'll be able to add to this great understanding of this divine literature. Mm -hmm. So maxim number three on the art of debate with an, evil, an equal adversary. In debate with an equal adversary, your skill is shown to its best advantage if you remain silent while he flounders in speech. The audience will be unmoved by his arguments while your rep reputation will soar in the eyes of the great ones. That's profound. <laughs> so now he's talking about what you do with someone who was evenly matched. Mm -hmm. Someone who was evenly matched. I think that this is very interesting once again. And, and once again, he doesn't say, well, this person is evenly matched. Speak as fast and as, as verbosely as you possibly can um, so that you can outmatch them. He says once again that you should wait and listen. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's also very powerful as well. Wait and listen, find your place, and give your words based on the holes in their argument rather than simply um, trying to prove that you know more than mm -hmm. they do. What you'll find in a lot of these spiritual books is that each uh, maxim or law or um, critical detail will f build upon the other. So some people will say, well, isn't it just repetition? And it's like, it's, no, it's not repetition. It's just, if once you learn the first one, you have to continue to build and continue to build until you've mastered that understanding, you've, max, you've mastered that maxim or law to the point where you've totally internalized it and you're able to be a more functioning human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so if we talked first um, about speaking with someone who thinks that they know much more, and then about someone who was actually evenly matched, mm -hmm. what do you think the next mm -hmm. maxim will be? <laughs> maxim four, on the art of debate with an inferior. In debate with an opponent who is by no means your equal, do not take advantage of his weakness by attacking him. Let him show his own mediocrity, and he himself will provide the rod <laughs> with which to beat his own back. Resist the temptation to show him up, and don't lose your temper. It is despicable to crush an inferior. People will then act according to your wishes, while your adversary will sink in the eyes of the great ones. Hmm. It is despicable to crush an inferior. <laughs> How many people believe that today? It is despicable to crush an inferior. I think that that is very, very powerful. Most people jump on the opportunity. Absolutely. <laughs> and some people think that everyone's inferior, so that's even worse. But it's despicable to crush people who are actually inferior in their thinking. That's, that's very, very powerful. That's very powerful. I, I, I remember, let's see if I don't tell too much here. I remember having a debate with a, a friend, a good friend, um, and he said something that offended me greatly. And I was having an argument, and as I had an argument with him, I began to realize that 
I was talking and I was drinking um, water or soda. And as he was talking, he was drinking gin and vodka. And so clearly he became inebriated. Mm -hmm. And he had said something that really offended me. So I continued to talk to him. I remember one of the individuals that I think is very wise came up to me and said that he learned a long time ago never to argue with fools <laughs> because onlookers will not be able to tell the difference. <laughs> And I thought that was just powerful. He was saying, listen, clearly there's no way that you're going to have an argument with this person that makes any sense. And so in actuality, as you argue with him in his ignorance, you both look ignorant. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was just very, very powerful. Once again, this is talking about um, having arguments with inferiors. Um, don't look to crush them. Don't Simply crush allow themselves. them to talk, and, and they'll trip up on their own argument. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's also very powerful. Keep in mind that these are also tools that you can use um, young people. You can use these tools. Mm -hmm. um, adults who are having difficulty at work, that you can use these tools. Um, these are all things that you can use regardless of where you are. I know that in, in, in marriage you, you, don't, uh, you shouldn't consider anyone in your marriage an inferior. <laughs> but clearly, I think these three maxims all together are telling you, stop speaking so much. Listen for a minute. Yeah. That's really what we should take away from this. And so I, I truly believe that if we listened more, we would have a more genuine debate. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, very powerful. Maxim five, on the art of being a leader while respecting the rule. If you have the responsibility of leadership and are in charge of setting guidelines for a large number of subordinates, Seek every opportunity to be effective so your behavior is irreproachable. Great is the rule. Its effect on both great and small is complete and long-lasting. The rule is illuminating and practical and has not changed since the time of Asar. Those who break the law must be punished, something the greedy fail to understand. Wrongdoers can achieve material gain but evil never leads to good. It is wrong to say, I want only to take things to enrich myself, rather than I want my actions to benefit the position entrusted to me. Whenever anything reaches its due term, it is the rule which endures. And a just man must acknowledge the domain of his spiritual father. That's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about there. First off, before you even continue, this is one of the things, while I really enjoy uh, a Christian Jacques' uh, uh, translation mm -hmm. of the text, this is one of the things that I would take issue with him on. You notice how many times he said the rule. <laughs> when he says the rule, the word that is being translated as rule is ma'at. Mm -hmm. And so to say the rule may not be as clear. If you say ma'at, then someone's going to say, well, what is ma'at? Maybe I should read the 42 negative confessions of ma'at. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should read the, what is generally called the Memphite theology, the, the, the great literature that comes down from us from a very old stage, but also from the 25th dynasty when they describe the creation of the world mm -hmm. and the existence of ma'at. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should read more about what this rule is so that I can generally understand what he means here. And so that's one thing that I'll take issue with him on. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that he starts out by saying, this maxim is about how to be a leader while respecting ma'at. What does that mean? That means that simply because you've acquired a great degree of power, simply because you are in a position where you have many people who have to listen and respond to you, you should not take advantage of your position. You should still live a maatical life. And in everything that you do, you should do these things in maat. Mm -hmm. Not simply because you are looking to increase your coffers or to fill your wallet, but because you are doing things in maat. Mm -hmm. And he talks mostly about how people who are beneath you will respond to it. So these are not um, maxims for only the rich, wealthy, and powerful. These are maxims for everyone. 
I think that that is critically, impo critically powerful. It is the kind of, of um, description that you would not expect to come from the Camites if you've been watching the History Channel, the Discovery Channel. All these, these um, descriptions that tend to describe Kemet only from the eyes of the powerful, mm -hmm. when clearly we have descriptions that come from those who understand that people of any position are important. He talks about how doing ma'at is important because regardless of what you're able to garner here on this planet, evil is fet, mm -hmm. is fet, is never something that you can escape. <laughs> when we think about individuals, I, I know that there's a very popular documentary now and I think even a play called The Smartest Guys in the Room and, and it deals with Enron and how they were absolutely dismissive about the position that they've put people in. and and um, they nearly choked an entire state, one of the most populous states, by the way, into insolvency simply because they were looking to fill their own coffers. And then when we look at what happened to many of those people afterwards, we know that their lives were destroyed. <laughs> and not destroyed by what some, someone else did, but, but destroyed by their own greed. And so he's talking to them, but he's talking to all of us, really. <laughs> he's talking about how doing things, even when people aren't looking, is important, mm -hmm. that you must always act in ma'at. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful. It's interesting how this, I know you were talking about creating the book to focus on certain people, but of course this is probably the first one that you'll put in a Pataho tep for businessmen, mm -hmm. businesswomen. Mm -hmm. But you know, the first thing that comes to mind, and of course, you know, being a state employee, realizing that right now we're in a crisis where our budget is overwhelming and there's threat of a state shutdown, mm -hmm. you have to wonder, well, what happened to the money? Right. You know, are the rich just becoming richer while mm -hmm. the poor continue mm -hmm. to have to pay the price? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you come and tell me that you're going to have a furlough mm -hmm. where we don't go to work one day a week and we don't get paid for it? But there are people making billions of dollars, people who are getting bonuses, you know, check after check, living a wonderful life. They don't see any responsibility whatsoever. That's right. They're all, they're all beholden to these maxims as well. Mm -hmm. What is your responsibility as someone who's bringing in these billions of dollars to save the crisis that can help us all as a people? That's right. Very, very important. He's talking to the powerful about how to be equitable. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we would all, keep in mind that even if you think you're not powerful, in some way you are. Mm -hmm. This could also be the maxim for the parent. Mm -hmm. This doesn't have to just deal with people who are in the business world. This also deals with how you behave when you're dealing with your children. Do you think that the real um, way to, to parent effectively is do as I say, not as I do? He's saying no, that in this instance, you have to make sure that whatever you do, you do in ma'at. Mm -hmm. And that you have to shun isfet, mm -hmm. which is the absence of ma'at as Anika has described. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is powerful. Think about all those ways that you are powerful in your life. Mm -hmm. And then say to yourself, am I wielding power in a way that is equitable? Mm -hmm. Am I a legitimate ruler or am I a tyrant? Mm -hmm. And I think that when we look at things that way, we'll find that this is a very, very powerful description for wherever you are in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maxim number six, on the vanity of human endeavors. Don't spread violence among men, for the inter will punish you likewise. A man may boast, this is how I live, but a single word can deprive him of his bread. He may state, I want to be rich and powerful, and subsequently confess that he has been trapped by his own plans. He may announce, I am going to steal from somewhere else. And in the end, he will find himself giving a gift to a stranger. For human endeavors never work out. It is what the inter ordains that is fulfilled. Be satisfied with what you possess, and the inter will grant all that comes naturally. Mm. <laughs> this begins by talking about not seeding violence amongst people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's also very powerful. We see ourselves in a world that is bereft of, of peace. I mean, we, we have a world that is um, 
put on the brink of destruction by violence in all different places around the world, around the globe. You can't look at any area of the globe and say this um, particular place is not affected by some sort of conflict. So he's talking about um, seal, uh, soiling, seeding the seeds of conflict and, and what does that do for someone? And I think that, that it's powerful that he says that instead of once again looking to acquire, acquire, accumulate, accumulate, mm -hmm. be happy with what you have and you'll get much, much more. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's, that's very powerful. We're in such a decadent society. That's you know, right. Everybody wants name brand clothes. Mm -hmm. They want to spend, you know, your value is based on what you own, not who you are. And you, you'll notice that people who have the least amount tend to be the ones who give away the most. Because I believe in their minds, they know that they'll get it back tenfold. And that's really what we should be understanding as mm -hmm. a people. The more you give, the more you will receive. Mm -hmm. Just the act of giving in itself gives you so much more than just constantly taking from somewhere else. That's right, that's right. Now, some of you might believe that this is one of the earliest descriptions of the term karma, and I think <laughs> that in many ways it probably is. Mm -hmm. He is talking about something that we would consider karma. You give and you'll receive, but if you continue to take, you realize that instead of taking, you're gonna be giving so much more than you believed you ever gave. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, and in this instance, he's not talking about giving in a way that is equitable or modical. Mm -hmm. He's talking about giving because you will lose. Mm -hmm. If you begin, if you continue to take and take and take, you will not have that which you think you deserve. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're not giving. Mm -hmm. And so the giving is how you will receive. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm often, um, plagued, and I think we all are plagued, um, by feeling that you just don't have enough sometimes. There's not enough money, there's not enough food, there's not enough time. But I think he's talking about the fact that all these things are a state of mind. Mm -hmm. All these things are a state of mind. And um, some of the happiest people are the people that have the least on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very powerful. And I know that sometimes when I look at those people who are wealthy and famous, it just amazes me that sometimes they just are not happy. And some of us who are struggling and working every day could actually think, well, how is they could have all of this money, these be this beautiful home and, and wonderful vehicles and, and the world is their oyster, how is it that they're not happy? And in actuality, he's saying that happiness is not about what you have, that if you are content, you will receive what you are supposed to receive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is a really beautiful description for um, depending on that which is divine, that which is um, internal, I'll call it here, um, that which the internal or the, or the divine force gives us. Mm -hmm. And we can also relate that again to environment. Mm -hmm. If we would stop destroying our environment and stop uh, trying to change the natural course of things within our environment, we'll realize that everything we need is already here. Mm -hmm. We don't have to manufacture genetically altered items all of the nutrition we need is here. If we understand the concepts of items being grown during different seasons and understanding why, then we would eat appropriately during those seasons. Mm -hmm. There are seasons where you're supposed to fast, and that's why there's less available, because those are the only items you're supposed to have. There are seasons when there are more bitter items than there are sweet, and that's another cleansing process. But we've gotten into a society where we're able to import things all over the world and change the natural course. That's right. That we don't understand the effect that it's having on our very that's right. bodies and the effect it's having on nature. You're losing trees that are that are supposed to be in certain areas. You're losing just the value of the foods that you're eating, the nutritional value is no longer there mm -hmm. because you're constantly altering it and changing the natural flow, mm -hmm. the natural mm -hmm. order, which is ma'at. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful description mm -hmm. that you can use in so many different ways in your life. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you're going to continue to look at these uh, maxims, these uh, sebait, and try to see how you can apply them to your own life. There isn't one of these divine teachings in here that does not apply to you. Let me say that again. <laughs> there isn't one of these divine teachings that does not apply to you. Those teachings that you think apply to someone else are perhaps the ones that are most important to you. <laughs> so go through them all as we will go through them all with you and see how you can apply them to your life. And, and I should say that as we sit here, clearly we even struggle. I was quiet for a moment because I thought about how it affected me in my personal life. And I think that we can all remember wisdom is not something that anyone can entirely attain. And so we can all uh, acquire greater wisdom through 
listening and focusing on the on Ma'at. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for more? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So, maxim number seven on table manners. You know, I mean, they even had on table <laughs> manners a maxim to focus on table manners and etiquette. Mom, if you're watching the show right now, <laughs> there's something else that you can do that's more important. <laughs> I remember how much time my mom spent on table manners, and I used to always think, well, who cares? When I get old enough, I'm going to eat by myself. <laughs> Whoever thinks it, who, who, how does that actually work? You know what I mean? But clearly, table manners are also important. So let's, let's continue with that one. <laughs> if you are among the guests at the table of a superior, accept what your host gives you and the way the food is presented. Look at what is before you, but don't stare at your host <laughs> too insistently for the ka, his vital energy hates being pestered. Don't speak to your host until invited to do so, since you will not know what he is feeling. Respond when he addresses you and try to make conversation attractive to him. Laugh when he laughs. He will be glad and approve your behavior, though you still will not know his innermost thoughts. As for the great one seated behind the offering table, covered with breads, let his behavior accord with the dictates of his ka, his creative energy. Thus he will give those he favors. Night brings good counsel. The creative power of the ka opens its arms and the great man bestows gifts on him who has achieved merit and the bread is eaten in accordance with the will of the inter. Ignorant is he who does not count his blessings. Now I couldn't help but laugh because as a child growing up, I used to hate having to eat at the table with guests, especially when I saw something that didn't look pleasing to me. And I used to try to find ways of throwing the food behind me when no one was looking. Oh my goodness. <laughs> try to s spread out the food to make it seem like I had eaten a lot of it. And I remember my mom would come by with a fork and scoop it all back up right, to the center right. and say, finish your plate. And it would drive me crazy because I didn't understand, you know, someone actually thought of you. Mm -hmm. Someone took the time to prepare something for you, something they didn't have to do, mm -hmm. but they did it with love and care. And the only thing you can do is accept it and respect the fact that they did this for you. Mm -hmm. But you know, as a child, even as an adult, there's still things that I don't want to eat. That's right. But you have to understand, even within different cultural settings, you have to understand that this is what they have. Mm -hmm. And this is what they want you to have, and it's them sharing a piece of themselves with you. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond just you not liking what's on the plate. It's beyond you, you know, wanting to get up from the table and go and watch television. It's you respecting that time with family and with friends and understanding that this is critically important for your own development. Keep in mind that he's also talking about how you behave when you're with someone who um, is considered uh, uh, is considered uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. And so how do you behave when someone, when you're sitting with someone who is powerful? Folks, I know that this man wrote this 4,400 years ago, but how many of us are looking to get ahead in business and wonder why what we're doing is not working for us? And so he's here talking about how to behave when you're having a meal with the powerful. That's just powerful to me that, that he would even think that this is something that we should learn 4,400 years ago and we can still use it today. He talks about um, saying things that are pleasing to the ka of someone who is powerful. Once again, we're talking about knowing a little about everything so that you're able to talk to people mm -hmm. in places so they also feel comfortable and, and making sure that you are, are comforting to them. Laugh when they laugh, he says. In other words, if someone is powerful and you want to get ahead. Mm -hmm make sure that you are able to show them that you are not that much different than you. Mm -hmm. That's really, than them. Mm -hmm. And that's really what he's saying here. Um, one of the comments that he makes that I think I still need to um, get into some deep intuition about, some deep meditation about is he says that, um, I think he said great wisdom is found at night. Yeah, night brings good counsel. Night brings good counsel. I'm not, I can't, honestly, folks, I can tell you that I'm not exactly sure what he means by that. I think it's possible that he's talking about, he may be talking symbolically about um, night being a symbolic um, 
uh, uh, description of the completion of the sun. Mm -hmm. That means when all things are complete, preparing for what you have done for the next day by thinking about what you've done in the day that has just passed. Mm -hmm. He may be also talking about when he says night brings good counsel about um, uh, thinking about how you've done at a time when no one is watching. I think he's talking about deep in introspection here. I think he's talking about thinking about yourself and thinking about what you need to do, do with yourself to become better. Mm -hmm. I know that Camites often, and this, is, this comes to us as descriptions of the mystery systems that come later than Kemet, mm -hmm. primarily in, in the Greek forms and in some that are in Italy. And, but there are people who followed Kemetic spirituality and didn't call it Kemetic spirituality for hundreds of years after Kemetic spirituality had ceased to be powerful in the region. And so um, I know that in their description, one of the, the, the most powerful descriptions I've ever read, um, one person who was an initiate of a mystery system says that at the night, his wife knows that he goes into a quiet room, a room where he focuses on the divine, and he thinks about his day, and he thinks about the things that he should, that he should have done and the things that he shouldn't have done, and he makes amends for those, for those things that he shouldn't have done. I think that as Camites, we've learned that we need to follow this, these 42, every, the, the 42 laws of Ma'at, sometimes called the 42 negative confessions of Ma'at, on a daily basis. And so that we're not just going to have our hearts weighed at the end of our lives, but that in fact, when the Camites talk about birth and death, they're talking about something that can occur at any moment. Mm -hmm. So that in sim symbolically, the beginning of your day is a birth, and the end of the day is a death. And so this could be also considered um, daytime and nighttime. And in looking at it that way, at the end of the day, we have to focus on that which is divine. At the end of the day, we have to focus on that which is divine. And in doing that, we have to go through all of these 42 laws and say, this is what I did. This is what I can do better. And, and figure out how we can learn and grow from, from focusing on our day. And I think that that may be what he's referring to here. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, I think we can cover maybe one more. Okay. That's great. Okay. Maxim 8, on respect for the mission entrusted to you. If a great man trusting you sends you on a mission to another, be completely scrup scrupulous in carrying out his orders. Relay his message as he worded it, and beware of false emphasis in case you set one great man against another. Do not deviate from the straight path. No show of emotion must be allowed to affect the transmission of the message. Neither insult nor slander anyone, be he high or low, for that is hateful to the Ka, the creative power. I notice that he translates Ka as creative power. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, generally, the way I, I interpret ka is it means soul, soul. Mm -hmm. but the Kamites believe that there were certain aspects of our soul, and, and I know that sometimes they say that when someone passes on to the other realm, they have gone to land of their cause. I think the ka is also the part of your soul which is shared with your ancestors. In a sense, um, it is that part of you that um, comes from some place where other people came from, mm -hmm. and so the ka is renewed mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, I think that. In that description of Ka, I think I, I see more in this particular maxim when I think of Ka in that way. Um, once again, he's talking about something that I think is very divine. Mm -hmm. um, when he talks about how you can um, go about carrying information between people and not and making sure that that information is not your information, but it's the information that was meant to be carried. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is also powerful. <laughs> think of yourself as a messenger at all times. Mm -hmm. Think of yourself as a messenger at all times. Folks, there are some of us who look at religious messages and we intuit all sorts of things that aren't there mm -hmm. and then we become judgmental to other people about them. Is that when you were supposed to be carrying the message from powerful person to powerful person, mm -hmm. to one divine vessel to another? There are those of us who have the, um, the key responsibility of um, ensuring that information is carried between people at work. Mm -hmm. And so how do we 
do this in a way that is equitable instead of, of harming people. Major wars have been started because people have not passed on messages the way they mm -hmm. should have been passed on or have decided to just give falsified information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is something that we need to make sure that we never set our tongues to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's also something that married couples can look at as well. It, it, it talks about how to speak to people. I know it says, it, he says, without emotion, but I think what he really means is not not to have emotion with what you're saying. But not let that drive everything. But don't let emotion drive everything. Mm -hmm. Try your best to say that which needs to be said rather than that which you think should be said because you're angry, that which needs to be, that you think needs to be said because you're trying to be vindictive. Rather, say that which you think can be helpful based on the individual that you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to interpret that in, in, in many, many different ways as well. I've enjoyed this. <laughs> yes, it's very, very powerful. Folks, and it's a shame we're, we going can't to, keep going. we're going to continue to talk about the Maxims of Patahotep, the world's earliest book. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll continue together to find ways to have divine knowledge from the knowledge that our ancestors gave us. This is extremely powerful, and hopefully you'll follow us on this great journey to exactly live in the way that our ancestors believed that we should. And so with that, as we always say, the divine force in us greets the divine force in you. Please make sure that you're following us. Yes. Um, we're getting to the point now where we're hearing a lot of feedback from you. Feedback in the street, feedback in the supermarket, emails, Facebook. telephone calls, Facebook. Yeah. It's wonderful that so many people have joined this grand dialogue that is Comedic Legacy today. And so we, we urge you to continue in this dialogue. Did one of these maxims speak to you in particular? Let us know. Tell us what you think about them. Mm -hmm. And certainly if we think that what you said can be helpful to everyone, we'll also talk about it on the show as well. Mm -hmm. Let us know if, you should, if we should include your name <laughs> um, so we don't embarrass someone who shouldn't be embarrassed. But clearly this is something that um, we think that we can all learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. With that, thank you so much. Please visit our website, www.cometiclegacy.com. And again, visit our Facebook pages for both the Center for the Restoration of Ma'at and Cometic Legacy Today. Twa'u. Twa'u. Anka Jasaneb.